What's up guys, welcome back to another GGF video and today we're going to be taking a look at the Meshalicious small form factor chassis. Now you may have seen some sneak peeks around on this chassis, it's actually just gone up for pre-order on Newegg now, so you can check out all the information there. And there's quite a few interesting things you can do with this chassis but I don't want to give it all away, so let's jump in and check it all out. Meshalicious derived by Mesh and Delicious is a feature packed small form factor chassis. Three of the four side panels are complete mesh with the bottom and rear of the case covered by even more mesh makes this one of the most versatile SFF cases on the market and we can really see where its name has come from. Coming in at 14.5 litres doesn't make this the smallest form factor chassis but being vertical means for a very small footprint, only 245 by 167 and with features like SFX and ATX PSU support, 4 slot GPU and some decent liquid cooling capabilities, I'm sure the Meshlicious is going to be favoured among many. So who makes the mess delicious? The brand is SSUPD, pronounced SUPD, is a sister to Lian Li, which definitely isn't a bad thing to see. Their website so far looks clean, and we can see some upcoming accessories for the chassis. And damn, that white version is looking tasty. Anyway, jumping back to the case itself, in this video I'm going to cover the main aspects of the case that are kind of relevant to custom cooling this chassis, things like GPU and radiator support. All side panels are removable, and pop off and on via little clips around the edge. The panels stay on well and don't just pop off randomly if cables are bulked behind. I feel the decision to go down this route was 100% the right one. I've taken these panels off and on over hundreds of times and it's been absolutely flawless. I could not have imagined doing this with screws or thumb screws like other chassis do. The mesh finish is some of the best I've seen and each panel has a bit of weight to them with minimal flexing. The mesh is fine, but not too fine to the extent where it's going to choke your hardware inside. I also love the little cutout around the I.O. and how it fits around perfectly. For front I.O. it's kept clean and can be found on the top where we have a Type-A USB 3.0, Type-C 3.1 Gen 2, power button and LED. Inside we find a split dual sided layout, motherboard and PSU on one side with GPU consuming the other side. Lastly a radiator if using one covers both sides at the front. This layout brings fresh air directly from the front for radiator cooling and fresh air directly from the side for GPU cooling. The chassis also supports 4 slot GPUs where the whole motherboard tray can shift over slightly. A spacer cover is moved from in front of the motherboard to behind the motherboard to make this work. Radiator support is great for an SFF case and it's one of the best I've seen. I was able to fit a 40mm thick EKPE 240mm radiator up the front with fans. The gap between the front and motherboard tray is exactly 65mm which is what you need for this combo, although one alteration was required. The screws holding in the 240 radiator brackets were slightly too long and this was just enough to stop the radiator from sitting flush in the case. Using shorter screws or adding washers to the current screws rectified this giving us 65mm of clearance. 280mm radiators are also supported by removing the two 240 rad brackets but unfortunately I have no 280 radiators on hand but after close measuring an EKSE 280 should fit in fine. If going with a custom loop there is no doubt you'll need to invert the radiator. With ports up top in conjunction with the motherboard's 24 pin there was just no room for access. One amazing feature in the Meshlicious is the adjustable GPU support. There are a total of three adjustable locations depending on your GPU height. By default, support is in the highest spot allowing for GPU length of 315mm which is the shortest support for GPU. As you can see, it looks like they modelled this fitment perfectly for a 3090 Founders Edition. This config gives you 42mm of clearance at the ION for GPU display cables. With this setup I had no issues plugging in standard GPU display cables. Shifting everything down one spot, which includes moving the PCIe riser cable and two support bars, now gives us 322mm 
simple GPU length, but now as everything has shifted down, we only have 35mm of clearance for GPU display cables, and unfortunately I was unable to plug in a standard DisplayPort cable. And lastly, the final position, everything is shifted down again, giving us the maximum GPU length of 313mm, but now only 24mm of clearance for GPU display cables. For example, the ASRock 6800 XT Tai Chi would need to be installed in the lowest GPU location as this GPU is 330mm long. Both the second and third configurations will require right angle GPU display cables. My unit was shipped with a right angle HDMI cable, but I'm still confirming the version of this cable and if a DisplayPort cable will be shipped with the unit as well. I'll cover these findings in the outro. Moving on to Waterblock GPUs, the above measurements still stay the same, but now GPU width comes into play. This is mainly due to the GPU's terminal interfering with the front radiator. I had no issues with 20 series reference cards as these are very narrow. If using an EKPE radiator at the front with fans, I had 145mm of clearance for GPU width. As you can see with my example 5700 XT Liquid Devil, it simply would not fit. If going with a slightly thinner EKSE radiator, I had 156mm of clearance for GPU. The chassis can also accommodate small form factor GPUs in a horizontal location by shifting the PCIe riser cable. Max GPU length here to the front of the chassis is 230mm but would eliminate the ability to install a front 240 radiator. Unfortunately, a longer riser cable is required for this orientation and is sold separately. I don't really see this being a huge deal breaker as not many people will be going down this route. The last area I want to cover in the Meshlicious is PSU support and the fact we even see ATX support is quite amazing. By default the SFX bracket is installed and with an SFX PSU I had 140mm of clearance to the front of the chassis for cooling, cables and whatnot. Simply remove the SFX bracket and now an ATX power supply can be installed. With this I had 100mm of clearance to the front of the chassis. For my build I've decided to go with a bit of a powerhouse but will be custom cooling the CPU only. The reason for this is I feel a 240 radiator just doesn't have the cooling capacity for a high end CPU and GPU. Main components include an ASRock B550 Phantom Gaming RTX which will be paired with a Ryzen 5900X and an EK Magnitude AM4 block. GPU wise I'll be using an RTX 3090 FE although I would not recommend this style of GPU for a chassis like this. As you can see the GPU's rear fan is completely concealed behind the motherboard. An ARB card with say 3 front fans would be a much better solution, but unfortunately I had none on hand. A Silverstone SFX 750 watt is the PSU of choice and have not decided to go with an ATX due to space requirements. I do need to route hard tube around this area so an SFX will make things much easier. And of course, some cable mod SFF cables will help with cable routing as these bend much easier than sleeved cables. Once again, I'll be using an AlphaCool IceDeck DCLT Dual Plexi Top with two AlphaCool DCLT 3600 pumps. I've used these previously in my SFF build and found they were a breeze to work with, so I decided to pick up some more for this build. Radiator and fans, I've gone all EK with a PE240 and two non RGB BATA fans. Now that's most of the case covered there, let's check out the build.
overall, I'm really impressed with how the system turned out. I think with the black uh, chassis itself, the EK satin titanium uh, fittings, and then that blue coolant all worked in together. Now jumping straight into the benchmarks, uh, just a recap, it is a 5900X, and I've done the test with PBO on, and then just the stock CPU, and we are running the EK PE240 RADs, EK VADA, VADA fans at 60%. Now I haven't added the GPU temps in here because I kind of thought it was unfair on both parties mainly because uh, this uh, Founders Edition 3090 does have the fan, the two fans, one on the top, one on the bottom, and that makes the bottom fan directly in between the motherboard. So the results would be a little bit skewed and I thought it was unfair to test the results in this chassis for this card. You really want to throw in something like a, a three fan uh, custom card that has the fans on the one side and that would give you much better cooling. But the temperatures for this card when I was testing, the lows were about 40 for idle, and then the maxes were around 75 degrees. Now jumping straight into the test, the room temp was 21 degrees. It was a little bit cooler than normal because I did have the aircon going. So Cinebench R20, 10 minute run at PBO, we're looking at 73.8, and then for stock, we're looking at 63.4. Moving on to Metro Exodus, PBO was 61.5, and then at the stock CPU, it was 60.6. Moving on to Ada, Ada 64 FPU, 10 minute run. Now this sort of cranked up the heat a little bit. This, this is quite stressful. Mind you, you're probably not gonna be doing something like this in a little chassis like this. Uh, PBO temperatures was 76.5. And then for stock, we're looking at 65.8. And then lastly, 3D Mark Time Spy. And once again, the CPU test does hammer the CPUs quite a bit. At PBO, PBO, we're looking at 74.9. And then stock, we're looking at 67.7. So overall, I was actually really impressed with temperatures in this chassis. Now bear in mind, we do have quite a thick uh, PE radiator. This is 40 millimeters thick. Most small form factor chassis can only run 30 millimeter thick radiators. So it does have that extra width there. And then we are doing the CPU only. So for people wanting to maybe add a GPU in the loop, I'd probably say this CPU is a little bit too much because we're already running it say in the 70s already. If you were to throw a GPU in this, it would run even hotter. You could probably get away with something like an i5, a 5600X, and you could also throw in a sort of a lower end GPU, probably a 3070, and you'd be able to get away with that. And for these PBO results, I was still pretty happy, and the CPU was turboing up to around 4.5 all cores, which was pretty nice as well. And moving on to some other areas, I do want to mention filling the uh, system like this was a bit of a nightmare. Normally when you have a, a build, your radiator is the other way, and you are normally using a reservoir, a dedicated reservoir, which does make filling much, much easier. Now I did have my fill port over here, you saw in the video, I had this lying flat and I was sucking the water in and around the loop. As soon as I got it full as to what I thought it was, as soon as I, as soon as I tipped the chassis back up, the radiator was half empty. So the water was just running down and that was causing the CPU block to be half empty. So how I rectified that is I put another T piece down the bottom. These are these uh, EK T pieces. They're from their torque lineup. They're really nice to use. I've got a stop fitting on there. So what I did is I flipped the chassis around completely upside down, managed to fill that radiator as much as possible, capped that back off, flipped it back around, filled up the, uh, the pump here a little bit, and then I got it 99% full. It's not perfect, but it is still much better than just having the one uh, the one fill port over here. Now mind you, it was going to be probably a no-go trying to get the fittings up here. As you can see, there is just no room here, especially with this uh, Azrock motherboard. The 24 pin is cranked right up the top. And even when I take this top off, there will just be no room for any, uh, any ports to run through at all because you do have the front IO that does take up a little bit of room up there as well. Now, moving on to the manual I was really impressed with. I actually just got this sent right now, the manual. I had to flick through it all. It's really good to have a heap of measurements in there. It kind of made all my work redundant. What I did, I measured all these GPU lengths uh, for you around the back, the gaps for the GPU lengths you can use, the gaps for the cables you can run underneath, but the manual has all this data in there as well. I did verify my data. Um, I'm off about one or two millimeters, which I think is, isn't too bad overall. Uh, for your GPU power, I didn't really measure this too much, but GPU power is quite tight. I am using a Founders Edition. I am using their extension, so it does make it a, a little bit easier. But if you are going with this, I'm gonna say sleeve cables for a beefier GPU are going to be very, very tight. So look into something like SFF cables. The cable mod ones I use for the rest of the components work really well. Uh, Mini DTX is a no-go. I measured that. It's going to be like if you could drop the power supply down one or two millimeters, you could probably fit DTX, so mini DTX, but I can't see too many people running that type of motherboard as I think there's only one or two out there at the moment. So that's probably not a big issue. 
Uh, storage at the bottom is quite neat. I didn't cover this earlier. I didn't think it was a huge sort of a deal, but um, after I saw the manual and where you can place all the SSDs, it's quite handy that you can fit one under the power supply, one under this section here, and then one in between, sandwiched in between the motherboard tray and the GPU. So that's three SSDs you can use that I could fit in completely in the system. I don't have to remove anything else. Um, I don't have to alter anything. I could just get those through. Um, cabling would be a bit of a issue trying to cable all those up. It would make it a little bit messy, but they do have that option there. And if you are going with the small form factor GPU solution, I keep turning this around. So if you do go with the solution with the GPU along the top here, you can run, they actually supply a hard drive sort of a cage that runs up here, and that allows you to fit two three and a half inch hard drives or four two and a half inch SSDs, and they just slot along like that, which I don't think too many people will do. Now, for those people who are wondering, who have a keen eye, I actually mentioned I did use an SX 750 watt. Well, I kind of actually lied. I do have a 700 watt uh, SFX in here, only because once I was installing this, the actual custom cables between the SX750 and the 700 are actually different. It's mainly due to the two GPU. So I did already have cable mod custom sleeve cables for the 700. When I went to put them in here, they didn't fit. When I did sort of make them fit because it was just a little bit of a flat bit on the connector so they could still go in, uh, it was uh, power faulting the uh, power supply. I used the tester, so it was definitely a no go. So that is a 700 in here. It did run the system fine, but I did really want to use this SX, SX750. So anyone out there that does have, say a few cable sets for the Silverstone range, these will require different custom cables. Now moving on to, I did mention earlier about an EK280, can fit up the front. Uh, since I was doing this video, I decided what the heck, I ordered one anyway. So I do have a 280. I just bought one straight away from the closest place I could find because I really wanted to measure this. Although I haven't been able to fit this uh, directly inside because I have I had already this built and filled. I had done some quick measurements by lining this up on the outside. I've done some measurements lining it up on the top. And from what I can see, it should fit fine. Uh, the outer tabs don't affect it. And it looks like the top IO and the bottom will fit that in fine. So an EK SE280 will fit in there fine. Um, another area I wanna cover are GPU cable lengths. If anyone wants to know my uh, lengths I used, the EPS I used was, turn this around once again, the EPS length I used was 490 millimeters long. Yet that's quite long for an SFF build. Only because this is vertical, normally if you go at the horizontal, your power supply is next to your motherboard and it just has to run straight along. Whereas this one has gone around the back up the top and then back over. So that was 490 millimeters. 24 pin is a whopping 600. That's only because of the way I routed it. I routed it around the back, up the side, along the top and back in. I thought that was the neatest way to do it. To do it any other way, you would completely see it from the front. There's just no other way to get the 24 pin or, or for this motherboard into this spot here. And now, as you can see around the back, if I go over, I just sort of got some Velcro ties and I think it looks pretty good. These are the cable mod SFF cables and it looks pretty neat just running up the side and the side cover does go on fine. Then the GPU ones are about 400. I actually didn't have a direct 12 pin uh, Nvidia connector for that. So I am running the splitter that comes with the Founders Edition card and then just the two uh, eight pins that run there and they're about 400 or so long and then they run up the side as well because I don't really think there's any other way you can do that as well. Um, I did mention this, the HDMI is version 2.0a and they haven't gone with the display port because it does bulk out the cost of the overall case. So I did reach out to them and they said a HDMI is included because it is much cheaper to add that. And if you do want to go with an SFF uh, GPU up here, say you're doing a little uh, home cinema setup or something like that, you will need to purchase that riser cable separately because the main one that comes uh, with the system is too short. That's about 140. You do need a 185 millimeter riser for that GPU. Now, lastly, this chassis has now just gone up for pre-order. I think in the last few hours, you can get it at newegg.com. There are two models. There is a cheaper one and there is a slightly more expensive one. The main difference is the cheaper one comes with a Gen 3 riser cable and the more expensive one comes with a Gen 4 riser cable. Now, if you think you might be wanting to do Gen 4, you have a Gen 4 GPU like this, a Gen 4 motherboard, I would 100% go with the Gen 4 uh, one with the riser cable only because I've been doing a lot of Gen 4 stuff lately and motherboards that or riser cables that are Gen 3, it's just a complete chaos. I probably swapped this video card so many times because the motherboard keeps defaulting back to Gen 3. 
Some motherboards you can just keep restarting and they may eventually go into the BIOS for you to do it, but this one didn't. And to remove this GPU, because it's so big, I had to remove this bar. By doing this bar, I had to loosen all the screws and sort of prise it out. And I had to do that so many times. So definitely save the headache, just get everything Gen 4 and you were good to go. So when it comes down to price, you're looking at $109.99 US, that's for the Gen 3 with the Ryzen cable, and then $164.99 for the one that comes with the PCIe Gen 4 Ryzen cable. So what's that about? $55 difference. So it's up to you. I've ordered a few Gen 4 Ryzen cables separately for other projects, and they've actually cost me roughly $80 to $100 Australian. So I think paying the extra 50 for this, I'll definitely go down that route. Anyway, I think that's it for this video. I did cover a lot there. I did speak pretty fast, but I didn't want it to drag on for too long. But um, yeah, I was actually really pleased with this chassis. I think it's gonna sell uh, relatively quick. It's got a heap of function, a lot of different uh, use cases you can do. You can use it for all the hard drives. You can use a smaller GPU, but I do think most people will be using the beefy GPU on the side there. But anyway, I wanna thank uh, SUPD, which they are called for sending this out for me to check out. I wanna thank you guys for watching and stay tuned for next time.